Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I can't believe it's the last day of BreatheCon, but we always save the best for last. My name is Danielle Nicosia, and I am one of the BreatheCon 2023 co-chairs. I am 37 years old and living with cystic fibrosis, like all of you. I am born and raised a true New Yorker, currently living with my fiance, newly engaged and super excited. I have worked in special education as a teacher and most recently the director of special education for the past 13 years, all based in New York. My journey with cystic fibrosis started once I hit puberty at 13. I was extremely ill with high fevers and constant bronchitis or what they thought and asthma and what I thought was awful stomach pains. After seeing over 10 doctors and receiving no answers whatsoever, I was finally diagnosed my senior year of high school at 17. Even though this changed my entire life as I knew it, it gave me a whole new perspective and taught me to value every single day. In November of 2019, my whole life changed again. I started Trikafta. What a change this has made in my life. I now am planning for my future with my amazing fiance. We've recently purchased a home and now we can consider wedding planning and so much more. Brian and I, my co-chair, knew immediately that we wanted to focus on mental health for this year's BreatheCon. We have both struggled tremendously with side effects from COVID and Trikafta. We want to use this panel discussion as a platform to destigmatize seeking for your mental health. I hope you take the opportunity today to listen, learn, and engage with our awesome keynote speaker. Before I introduce today's keynote speaker, I want to go over a few related items to technology and how we all can interact with today. First, you're going to notice both the event-wide chat and the stage chat. The stage chat is where you can interact with other participants like you have for the past two days. Watching the keynote and the event-wide chat is available for everyone in attendance today. The keynote is being recorded and will be available to all registrants after the event, in case you want to rewatch it. We will be taking audience questions during the second half of this keynote panel. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time into the Q&A box. We will do our best during our panel to answer as many of your questions as possible. As a reminder, this discussion is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment recommendations. Do not make any changes to your own treatment plan without first consulting your care team. We have counselors on call as well if at any point you feel overwhelmed by the conversation. Please seek the visit help desk to request to connect with a counselor at any time. Now I have the honor to introduce Maura Hagen. Maura Hagen is a social worker and mental health coordinator at the Gunnar Esiason Adult Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at Columbia University Medical Center. I also have the pleasure of saying that she's my social worker and has been a huge part of my mental health journey over the past few years. Maura was able to guide me in the right direction when I was feeling extremely anxious and experiencing panic attacks for the first time after COVID and after some tri trichapta side effects. She always remains calm and patient and is always resourceful. I know you will see the same today. Welcome, Maura. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I really so, appreciate it. And I'm so happy to have you. I'm so excited that we were able to connect. And of course, I have to brag about the gutter Esiason um, and my care team just being the truly the best. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm pretty proud of our team, too. That's so great. So we're going to start off. Um, with a couple of things that I just think people on this panel and people in our audience are just really thinking about. What are the different types of mental health professionals and kind of what are their roles? I know it can be super confusing knowing the difference, who can give treatment, who can give medication, who's kind of a talk therapist. So I would love if you can kind of explain that a little further. Sure, no problem. So first of all, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor, you know, who goes to medical school and he specializes mostly in medication management. A psychiatrist is someone you would wanna go see if you wanna be evaluated to determine whether or not you think you should be on medication for, you know, it could be anxiety, depression, bipolar, you know, for mental illness. 
Okay. And they sometimes do talk therapy. It's very rare. Mostly their medication management. And then you have a psychologist who does psychotherapy. They also can um, diagnose uh, mental illness. And then you also have social workers who are licensed to also provide psychotherapy. Uh, social works, though, you'll see they are in many areas. They're in mm -hmm. schools, they're in hospitals, they're in clinics. They have many, many roles, but they also, there are licensed clinical social workers who focus most of their practice on, you know, psychotherapy, doing private practice. You know, they make that their full-time job. Or like myself, I'm a mental health coordinator slash licensed clinical social worker in the clinical setting. And, you know, I do assess <laughs> patients' um, anxiety and depression. Um, we do that at least once a year using screens um, for anxiety and depression. And actually, I'm sorry, I didn't finish. So <laughs> psychologists and, and social workers are your, your best bet for psychotherapy. Like if you're looking okay. for ongoing therapy, you know, talking and supportive counseling, that's the way to go. But if you need medication management, a psychiatrist is your best bet. Although some doctors, you know, primary care doctors will prescribe antidepressants, anxiety medication. Um, sometimes um, CF doctors are willing to do it, especially now because of trichafta and the side effects of anxiety being increased. They are willing to start it, you know, but we really, you have to be very much in contact with your doctor, you know, to let them know how you're doing on it. Yeah, I think that's such a great point to mention. I know um, I was struggling really, really hard with finding <clears throat> a therapist. And I think I've reached out to 10 different ones and I really just didn't know where to go. And I think once I started and I found a talk therapist, my lung doctor was willing to start me on an anti-anxiety med until I found a psychiatrist. Once I found that psychiatrist in conjunction with my talk therapist, I was like, okay, now I'm going to pass over and he'll be able to prescribe. But yeah, with Trikafta and all the side effects, I think it's just such a, another avenue people can take and just a great place to start. It is a great place to start. And actually the way you did it is really ideal sometimes because you have, you're in touch with the primary or the pulmonary doctor. Mm -hmm. She knows you for a long time or he knows you and you can start taking the medication, but ideally in conjunction with therapy and you know, someone who specializes mostly in medication is your best bet with a psychiatrist. So you have a good team there to help you. That's awesome. Um, and then kind of just leading into this. So at what point do you kind of recommend, okay, I see that you're struggling. I'm your social worker at your local CF care center. And now it's kind of a point where I think I need to seek professional help. What kind of signs am I looking for as someone with cystic fibrosis, maybe not on trikafta, maybe post-transplant, um, maybe I don't qualify for trikafta, any of those things. At what point are you kind of like, I think you need to seek professional assistance with or without medication? What would you say are kind of like the signs? The signs for me and is really persistent anxiety and depressive feelings that are ongoing for greater than you know three months or so. And I start by screening everyone once a year and this is probably, it's done in most clinics. It's, um, we use two screens, one for generalized anxiety disorder. It's called the GAD-7 and okay. also the patient health questionnaire. It's nine questions and they're depressed. They rate you, you, um, sorry, they're questions and you look at the answers. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes patients, they're elevated because of life circumstances or they're in a, an exacerbation. So mm -hmm. just because you score high on a screen doesn't necessarily mean you have a disorder or there's something, it's not a crisis at the moment. But if somebody continuously has these feelings of hopelessness, of feeling down, sleeping too much, not related to their, their illness, um, lack of interest in doing things that they used to like mm -hmm. to do, yeah. If this is just an ongoing theme that's just not temporary because we all go through life is hard and we have ups and downs. Sometimes we're more motivated than others, but we really look for when it's persistent. Okay. And if it's interfering with your ability to take your medications, work, relationships are suffering. When all those things start getting affected, it's, it's recommended, you know, you should really see someone about this, you know, talk to someone on a regular basis. But I also want to say, 
I really hope that everyone understands that even when you're feeling great, having a therapist is a wonderful resource. We don't need to just go seek counseling when things are bad because they can really help you just with every day, you know, having someone once a week who's there an hour to listen to you is a wonderful way to keep your mental health balanced throughout the year. So if you're not in therapy and you think, well, I'm doing okay, it's still all right to reach out and find a therapist. Because you, you know, dealing with chronic illness, you know, it's a little bit, you have a little bit more on your plate than the average person. So I can't speak yeah. more about, highly enough about just having that resource in addition to your CF team. A hundred percent. I think going to weekly therapy for me has been an absolute game changer. Even if that week happened to be a calm week or, you know, not too much happened, it's still, it's just such a great release and just to get some great advice. Um, we just had a quick question. Could that questionnaire also be used for a PTSD, the questionnaire that you had mentioned, or is it just strictly anxiety and depression? Um, I have not. That's a good question. Post-traumatic stress disorder does manifest itself with anxiety and depression. So mm -hmm. I think using that screen could help indicate that maybe you are going through, um, you have some post-traumatic stress happening in your life that's been exacerbated. You know, you may have been triggered recently by a past event or it's just ongoing trauma that you've experienced. It is a good tool, just kind of like a spot check, really. I mean, it's, I, I give it out every day to patients. And sometimes I look at it for myself and I think, you know, it's been a few days. I, I, I'm not feeling great. Like, mm -hmm. what are the things that I need to do to help break the cycle? You know, and we can get into that later. But, you know, did I eat well today? Mm -hmm. Did I get sleep? Did I get exercise? You know, those are the kind of things that um, can help improve mental health That's and awesome. emotions. Thank you so much for that. And then my next follow-up question would be, how do you go about finding a therapist, which I have struggled and then I finally found an amazing one and I'm so, so happy. But how do you kind of determine if it's a right fit? I know that a lot of us with CF think like, if they don't know anything about a chronic illness, how are they going to best support me? And what are kind of some key things that we should look for in looking for a therapist? <clears throat> it's a great question, Danielle. And it's, um, it is, it's very hard to find a therapist um, especially right now, which is, I have to say, a good thing because more and more people are reaching out and wanting to engage in therapy. So it is destigmatizing getting help for mental health, but it also makes it really hard to find somebody. And yeah. of course, I have to talk about insurance, which, which I wish we never had to bring up that everybody could just go to a counselor and we didn't have to worry about co-payments. Are they in network? But unfortunately, that's the reality of how healthcare works today. Yeah. So if you want to go in network, what I tell patients is it's really good to go on the back of your card. Sometimes they have behavioral health hotlines, or if you can log into your insurance's website, look, search for behavioral health. You can look for a licensed clinical social worker, you know, a psychologist, a counselor, and then call, make sure that they are still accepting your insurance. Many times um, the plans are not updated. Mm -hmm. And then I recommend going to psychologytoday.com. And we have that on the resource page because within that site, you can search for therapists and you can see if your therapist on your insurance is also listed there because I give a little blurb about who they are and what type of practice they do. And you can look for someone who specializes in chronic illness or who works with anxiety and depression or LBGQ. You know, it, it helps you filter it out and that kind of helps with sorting out who might be the best fit for you. You know, think about, am I more comfortable speaking with a woman or a man? You know, mm. if you only want to speak to a woman, you know, filter it women only. Um, and another great thing to do is just ask around, yeah. ask your friends, ask, you know, do you know anyone? Have you seen anyone that you've liked? Because that also is a, a way to find someone that's, um, might be a good fit. And I'm beginning to build a resource of therapists who are available. Oh, so amazing. I would say, talk to your social worker at your clinic. You know, they may know someone who's accepting patients um, unfortunately, you know, insurance does come into play, so it's not, yeah. the list is, is there. And I'm hoping that more and more people can see these, um, providers. Um, the other thing is 
once you do find a therapist, do know that this is a relationship that, you know, whenever you meet anybody new for the first time, it may not feel that great, but right. give it a shot. And it is, you have to find someone that you feel safe, that you can be vulnerable with mm -hmm. and that you trust. And sometimes maybe the first visitor will be like, this person's not for me. <laughs> I don't recommend making quick judgments, but you know, give it one or two times, you know, it's, this is about you and it's your hour. I want, you should feel really comfortable with this person. Just knowing that you can share, you know, you can be vulnerable in that space. And it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to find the right fit. And I think people kind of give up because they're like, oh, they've had bad experiences in the past. For sure. But you know what I can share? I've had a number of like therapists that were kooky, you know, and I had, you know, I had someone ask me to speak to a rock. And I was like, you know what, this isn't going to be for me. <laughs> so, you know, you just keep trying until you find the right fit. No, that's that's really, really great advice. Thank you for that. Um, and then I would say, you know, pivoting just a little bit, but how do you cope with your CF and having a chronic illness? Now, I obviously know that you work in the CF care center. You do not have cystic fibrosis. However, your population that you work with all have cystic fibrosis. Um, so what are some things... You know, I know that I've had a lot of guilt, especially in the past two years. I've had COVID two times. I had lots of viral infections with everything fun running around uh, this winter and just, you know, having to call out of work and just a lot of different things that I've had to miss. Um, kind of what is your strategy with your advice that you would give to others with cystic fibrosis and just being okay with saying no? I feel like I struggle with that so much. Right. Yeah. It's, I think saying no and setting boundaries is really hard. And especially for people, you know, who have a chronic illness and who probably for a long time have had to cancel plans, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't feel good. My advice is that you have to accept and allow your feelings, you know, identify like, okay, I feel guilty. Why do I feel guilty? And then acknowledge that like, you know what, I'm taking care of myself. And that is important. Saying no is really sometimes a necessity. Like you have to think about yourself and that in order for me to be a better friend or to be a better girlfriend or coworker, I have to take care of myself now so that I can be there for you in the future. And I think speaking honestly and directly to your friends, colleagues, whoever, your, your network of people, and those people will understand if they're really your good friend, a good coworker, you know, it's, um, and I think it's important to express that, like, look, I would love to join, you know, when you're making plans or mm -hmm. just always let them remind them that, you know what, today I feel great. But, yeah. you know, with cystic fibrosis, it's really unpredictable. I can't tell you what I'm going to feel like in a week. But I tell you, if I'm well enough, I really want to be there for you and I'm going to come. But please know that if I'm not feeling well, I'll have to take care of myself and I may have to say no. It's, it's so hard. Of, it's so hard. It's so hard. I know, but it takes practice. I yeah. think saying, just saying no can sometimes also be a complete sentence. You don't have to over explain yourself, you know, and giving yourself permission to be uncomfortable with it. Also just saying like, it's okay. I know it's really hard, but it's the best thing for yourself. It's also just self-care. Yeah. And many times we're not used to caring for ourselves. That and is you, you are. Point. But <laughs> I'm not saying that any of this is easy. It takes practice and you have to sit with feeling uncomfortable for a few minutes after you said no or you had to change plans. And the other thing I would tell patients is just because you think something doesn't necessarily make it so. Mm. Your feelings aren't always fact. You may say, oh, this person's so mad at me. They're never going to like me again. You have no idea what they're thinking or what they're feeling. No, so. it's very, very true. Um, and then, so kind of a follow-up question to that part. So we know that CF affects every single person super, super differently, right? And so kind of what strategies do you recommend for those who are not eligible taking Trikafta or maybe waiting for a transplant or just in any, you know, maybe Trikafta, um, they've had to stop using Trikafta and kind of what coping, because that really can affect your mental health. And you think one thing is going to happen and things have drastically changed or you you know, you're going on a different path. So what do you recommend for those people? And maybe what strategies would you recommend for that? Okay. So yeah, it's, um, I've come across that, a, you know, a few times with patients who are not eligible for Trikafta, 
or any modulators and they feel left out, you know, the kind of the forgotten bunch. And what I remind them is that although they may feel badly about it, they have to accept that that's the reality of it right now. And that by continuing to take care of themselves every day as best that they can, and will ensure that they're here in the future when there is going to be breakthroughs because CF is working really hard, you know, to find other medications to help those who aren't necessarily eligible right now for modulators. I want them to seek out support from other people, other patients who are in a a similar situation. Um, If they feel down when they see on Facebook, everybody who's having a wonderful life and they feel like they're not, you know what, maybe decrease the amount of time you're on social media, Mm. build a network of friends who, you know, virtual, who also are in the same boat as you are, you know, and really just being kind to themselves, doing the best that they can, helping somebody else, you know, maybe reaching out to another CAF person who's also, when you're out, when you go outside of yourself and you help someone else, you start to feel better about Mm. yourself your situation. And um, yeah, I think getting involved with the CF community can also help with that. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's, um, yeah, and even patients who have to stop taking Trikafta because of side effects, Mm -hmm. you know, to be kind to themselves, reach out to others, speak to their CF team, and just continue to be the best patient that you can be every day by taking your treatments taking your medications, coming to your follow-ups. Even if you're feeling well, come, t- please come see us. You know, we like to see you more than once a year. Yeah, I think that's been my biggest thing of, oh my gosh, I don't need my vest anymore, but like I'm still too scared to stop using my vest. And it's like, hey, have you stopped using your vest in Strike Captain? Just like kind of talking with, I have a really solid group that I've actually met here on BreatheCon. Oh, that's um, nice. So amazing and late diagnosis and just like so many groups of people and hopefully people will see in our breakout groups later on today, they'll meet, they'll meet that friend that they can just kind of confide in. So, right. Yeah. I think that is so important. I think I left that out. Um, Peer support is a wonderful way to cope with what you're going through. I don't, it's really wonderful to be able to talk to someone who really has been in your shoes, you know? So it's, I love that the CF foundation has, you know, peer connect. I love, this is a great place for people to connect, and it's super important That's for awesome. overall well-being. For sure. Um, so we have a couple of resources. Um, a member of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is going to put them in the chat for all of you to see. So the first one, if you can just kind of talk us through more, is the self health self help resources for mental health problems, and the second one is Cystic Fibrosis Research Inter. Institute, if you can kind of talk mm-hmm. through, you know, what these resources are, and we're going to sure. put them into the chat. And then later on, you guys will get a resource guide um, after BreatheCon is finished. Okay. So the first one is the, I'm sorry, you said the, um, it's the, uh, the self-help center. resources. Say that again. Sorry. Yeah. The resources looking after yourself and then oh. also, also the CFRI. Okay. So the, the website, it's from uh, the Center for Clinical Interventions, and it has a whole, it's resources for both clinicians, for just regular people looking to do a little, you know, self-help. And they have all kinds, you know, anxiety, depression, procrastination, body image issues. They tell you a little quick, they have, um, I don't know if you can see this, quick one page, like information about all. That's awesome. So this one is mindfulness and letting go, which is really helpful for anxiety, even for depression. Um, Just little tips on how to do mindfulness. How do I just sit and be in the present moment, which will help bring down, you know, if you're anxious, your blood pressure or a racing heart. Um, And they, here's one that I hand out a lot is one on sleep hygiene. Mm. These are all on, on this website and it's, you know, it gives you 15 things you can do to sleep better, which is, you know, very important for mental health. We have to get sleep. We have to eat well. We have to exercise, connect with other people. That's awesome. That's a really great um, resource. There's a lot there. So. And then can you tell us just uh, briefly about the CFRI? Yes. So the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute is a wonderful um, resource. They have 
support groups. Um, I highly recommend them. Again, peer support is really important. You'll meet other people with CF who are struggling with probably one of the issues that you've struggled with. You know, people mm -hmm. can go there talk about getting married or having children. You know, mm -hmm. they have groups for women. They have a Spanish um, support group. So they have that. They also have, which I tell a lot of patients, and they do have uh, financial resources to help pay for psychotherapy. Oh, wow. And they can pay up to six sessions um, for treatment. And what you have, you'll see on the page, you would contact Sabine Bryant. She has her email there and ask her, you know, if there's funding available. And then they'll take you through the process of filling out the application and they will pay six sessions. Wow. That's okay. really amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, even before Maura and I were talking about planning the session, I was like, oh, I didn't even know about this one. This is such a great one. Yeah, it's really good. I, um, I'm so happy I found it. Actually, you know how I found out about it was through Compass, which is another, I, I'm going to plug Compass. Yes. Um, they help the patients as much as they help. They help me too. Cause you know, I'm relatively new to CF. I've only been here three years and I, you know, sometimes I don't know. So yeah, shoot quick email to uh, compass like, Hey, have you guys ever viewed it? And so they helped me build up my resource list to help the patients. That's amazing. Um, so I'm going to end off this part before we jump into our Q and a, how can patients collaborate with their CF team? I'm very, very fortunate. Um, and any of you who are on today who go to Gunnar Siasen, I am definitely biased because I feel like I can text and email my social worker, my dietitian, my nurse, my doctor at literally any time, and I will get a response. But maybe if their care center works a little bit differently, how would you best recommend that a CF patient collaborates with their CF care team as far as you know, seeking out mental health um, and even asking for those types of screeners that I know you give out um, to me and to other CFers. Okay, my the first thing I would recommend is please go to your quarterly visits. You know, I think it's really important that you show up even if you're not even if you're feeling great. And when you <laughs> are there, make sure that you you touch base with each of the providers. You know, and if it's the social worker you want to see, just say you know what I really want to see the social worker. And, and wait, you know, sometimes I know these visits are very long and it can be annoying, but it's worth it. Even if just to get their phone number and their email and say, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling. Can you give me a call? I know social workers are willing to say, okay, well, we can't meet today. That's fine. I'll call you tomorrow. When is a good time? You know, so it's really important. Show up, be honest. You know, we can't read your mind. You know, many times, you know, the, the providers will say, oh, they, they, they seem great. And then next thing you know, you get, they're in the middle of a crisis and they never said anything. So it's really important. The providers do want to know how you're doing, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And if your social worker is not screening, you know, it's recommended by the CF Foundation that at least once a year you do those, the GAD7 and the PQ8, the PHQ9, mm -hmm. at least once a year. You know, and if they're not doing it. You could say, Hey, you know what? I heard about these screens. You know what? I think I'd like to do it. I'd like to know where I am at right now. Um, so don't, don't be shy. I think yeah, it's advocate really... for yourself for sure. Yes. I think that's a huge number one step. And for some people, I mean, I will literally talk to anybody who will listen. Um, but I know not everybody is that way, but advocate for yourself. Um, you have a social worker at your care team and you have so many different resources. Use them. Use them. Exactly. I think um, reaching out to the social worker, at least I can say at the Gunner's House, and our team is really accessible. But if you find, you know, maybe take a few minutes just to, you know, talk with the social worker, talk, with, just try to, you know, don't just come in, do your visit and quickly rush out. Right. You know what I mean? Take a little bit of time. And if it can't be that day, then send an email or call. And if you don't hear back, call again. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, be your own best advocate and speak up. And yeah, that's, I mean, my advice. You that know what I mean? So that was awesome. I hope that we all enjoyed that. I see a couple of Q&As that have come in. Um, so we have a question here from Laura. Okay. What are your thoughts for people that think therapy might be beneficial for them, but aren't sure what they need to address 
or what even their goals for therapy should be? Okay, great question. I think therapy is just beneficial. You don't have to have goals in mind. You know, you don't even, it could just be to go. You would be surprised what will come up when you spend an hour with somebody who really just wants to listen to you. Just even, week by week, you may start to see a theme about things that are happening in your life. And then you might see like, oh, this might be a goal for me is learning to say no without feeling guilty mm. or stop people pleasing. You know, you're always worried about everybody else but yourself and your health is being affected. But you're so you've been trained to just care about what somebody else needs or wants. Mm -hmm. And you don't know this maybe right now today, but just by talking with someone and over time, you, you'll start seeing patterns in your own behavior and things that make you uncomfortable. You might say, you know what, I want to explore that some more. So I don't think you have to really go in with like goals in mind. I mean, you could just go and say, you know what, I just need to talk to someone outside of my family, outside of work, outside of friends, someone who's going to give you honest feedback. And things will come up, I think. I, I think that will, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, and then Laura, she actually asked know. follow up questions. She said, Maura, you were always great, so she must know you. Oh. Um, I, then I think you kind of answered her second question, which was, are setting goals for addressing and therapy even realistic? And I think you kind of said they can be, but they don't necessarily have to be, right? Like right. you don't necessarily have to go in with a goal. You don't have to go in with a goal, but you may, one may eventually emerge when you're talking to your therapist and, you know, she may, or he may say, okay, you know what, let's put this down for a goal for next year or yeah. the next six months. You know, it's, um, it's an evolving relationship and don't feel pressure that you have to have even a diagnosis. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be bipolar to seek therapy. That's you great. Know? Another question came in, um, I think from Rachel. I have such mixed feelings when it comes to letting your CF, CF team know about your mental health. Does anyone else feel, and she kind of put this out to the chat too, does anyone else feel that your doctors mask your mental health with drugs? Just curious. Um, so she kind of put this to the chat to everybody, but letting your CF team know about your CF because they're kind of hesitant because they'll just throw more medicine at them. What would you kind of say to that? What I say to that is, I, okay. Yes. I, I could see where you feel that like, oh, if I bring this up, they're going to quickly say you need medication. Mm -hmm. My experience is that doctors really don't want to keep adding medications. Yes. It can seem like a quick fix and a band aid, Right. But I think what they, if you share honestly with them, they'll want you to be evaluated more by a professional who can make that determination if you need more medication. And if they do, let's just say you do have a provider who says, oh, I think you should go on Lexapro. You could say, mm -hmm. you know what, thank you for that suggestion, but you know what, I'm going to think about that. You can then talk to your social worker about it mm -hmm. um, and then talk to a counselor, see a psychiatrist, you know, because medication doesn't always have to be prescribed. You can try other ways, you know, therapy, exercise, meditation, yoga. Um, and you have to do what's right for you, right? Exactly. I know for me, I've never had panic attacks before and I literally was not willing to even leave, leave the house. And they were happening at the same time every day when I got home from work. And I, I tried every strategy in the book. And for me, I had to go on medication. Yes. And I was like, well, we're just going to add it to the cocktail of other meds that I take. And it's, it's such a difference, you know? Right. So, but that's me personally, and that's not everybody. And I think everybody has to make the best decision for them. And for them, exactly. And there's no... Yeah, I agree. I think there are certain situations where medication is the best thing for you. And you, but it's not for everyone. Yeah. And I think Danielle just gave a very good example when someone would say, you know what, I think medication is necessary. Mm -hmm. There's only so much you can do outside of medication to, you, you can't live with panic attacks every day at a certain time. Like that's yes. interfering with quality of life, probably relationships, probably work. Everything so, you're saying yeah. is very accurate. <laughs> um, we have another question in the chat that says, is there a preference to find someone that knows about cystic fibrosis or chronic illness? Um, I mean, I can say for me personally, I am working with a therapist that works um, actually with cancer patients and other chronic illnesses. She doesn't necessarily have another CF clientele or she may 
but not a large one. Um, so for me, it was important that somebody understands what a pick line is, understands different medical procedures. I know for me, that's just something that I really wanted. Um, Maura, what would you say? Is there a preference or is there a benefit? Um, or could you possibly have a therapist that doesn't necessarily understand chronic illness? I'd like to say that all therapists are going to be mindful of how chronic illness affects the well-being of the patient. So I don't think you have to necessarily like search for, oh, they specialize in chronic illness. I do think it's helpful. Like Danielle was saying, like that may makes her feel more comfortable knowing that she works with other type patients with chronic illness, cancer, or, but we're all trained to look at the whole person and to be mindful of everything that's happening in their life. You know, I think, I think it's wonderful when there's cystic fibrosis uh, patients who are also mental health counselors. I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah. I also, I know that there are CF social workers who do private practice. Yeah. Ideally, like if that's, um, if they're available, I think it's a, would be a good place to start, but I don't think it's necessary um, specifically like say, oh, well, if they don't list that on their, you know, their blurb that they work with chronic illness, I, but everything else you like about, you know, they look like they'd be a good fit. Try it. Would, try it. But yeah. um, okay. it's a good question. Yeah, I thought that was a great question. Um, so somebody asked in the chat, I recall the CF Foundation had implemented a national requirement of clinics to assess all patients, but I have never had, this person has says, but I have never had it again since. Is there a CFF protocol for centers to assess patients annually or only as needed? That's a great question. Great question. And yes. So the CF Foundation, the Mental Health um, Committee, does recommend that each patient is assessed once a year for anxiety and depression. They no recommend this. Yeah, no matter what. Once a year, okay. they recommend it using the GAD7 and the PHQ9. And then from there, you know, if somebody scores very high, like above five, and they're not in the middle of an exacerbation. Because, you know, when you're sick, you can sometimes just, all those questions are like, yes, every day I feel tired and down. Blah, blah. Um, it's recommended you reassess at the next visit. Okay. And then, you know, if patients have minimal or no symptoms, no need to keep doing it every time they come in, because then survey fatigue and it becomes meaningless. Right. But yes, the, the CF Foundation does recommend um, CF centers should be doing it. I mean, I don't want to say should, but it is highly recommended. Okay. I mean, I can share that the social worker before me, she did not use the screens. Mm -hmm. um, she assessed anxiety, depression in a more organic way. But um, I find that this is more useful because then we can look back and say, you know what, last time you were here, you were, it was really high. Yeah. You know, what's going on now? You know, so it's, it's a good tool. And I think if it's not happening, you could gently just ask the social worker, hey, I was at this conference and, you know, I learned about these, these screens, you know, I'm interested in, you know, doing it, you know, I think maybe it was they so don't know, you know, I know, I was just gonna say that, like, even when you gave me the screener, but the previous person did it, I was like, Oh, this is so wonderful. And then I scored super, super high, like, which, well, yeah. <laughs> like off the charts high. And then we're like, okay, great. Now it's time to reassess. Right. And now we do, I take it now and I'm much more lit in the like, quote unquote, normal range. Right. And right. We're taking steps and all that. So, um, oh, we have another question. Okay. Can you describe, and this is different for kind of everybody I know, signs of panic, signs of anxiety and kind of like tips or tricks. I know, you know, kind of for me, panic attacks were new for me. Um, I would wake up having panic, which is super scary because you think you're fast asleep and you wake up with heart palpitations and all the things. Um, and so for me, it sounds super, super silly, but a really good strategy I had that my therapist taught me was to name a fruit or a vegetable for every letter of the alphabet. And it sounds totally bizarre in the moment, but then all of a sudden you're so focused on a vegetable or a fruit that starts with the letter H. Somebody in the chat, please help. Because when I get to H, I'm like, but the whole point is to distract yourself and to kind of get you out of that moment. So what are signs of panic or anxiety you know, that you would maybe say, oh, I think maybe it's panic or anxiety and it's not health, heart, that type of right. stuff. Yeah. I would say though, if you've never had a panic attack, 
and all of a sudden you do have sy the symptoms, Danielle, mm -hmm. you know, describe them can be rapid heart rate, sweating, chills, nausea, feeling disassociated, mm -hmm. an overwhelming sense of fear. Like a panic attack will come on suddenly. It doesn't necessarily need to be triggered by something. Um, I always say though, if you never experienced one and you have one, please see meta see see a medical doctor as well, just in case, just rule out any other, you know, if it's a medical um, problem. And um, and then a panic, so panic attack, and then there's anxiety attacks are a little bit, a panic attack has more of a time, it could be five, 20 minutes maybe right. happening, whereas um, anxiety attacks can be triggered by something or an event or a place, and it's just this excessive worrying and trepidation mm -hmm. that can go on longer and, you know, it lasts longer. It's not quite as acute, just you, you, you still have that uneasy feeling, the ner nervousness, you might, you know, dizziness. And uh, Danielle, yes, grounding yourself is really important. You can do mm -hmm. naming, out, naming vegetables <laughs> eight, or sitting in a chair and just saying, okay, I'm sitting in the chair. I feel my feet on the ground. I feel right. my hands, my hands are on my knees or looking around the room and just name five objects. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a clock, I see a table. So you really, what you're trying to do is distract your negative thoughts into the present moment, really trying to ground yourself in the present really does help decrease those feelings and deep breathing. You can do um, holding your breath for four, Breathe in for four, hold for four, exhale for six, repeat 10 mm -hmm. times, uh, counting backwards by three. Really, it's just bringing your focus into the present moment because anxiety and panic attack, well, panic attack is like the body's just freaking out. Right. You know, and you want to kind of try to slow everything down. Right. And, you know, worry and anxiety is mostly about future worries that we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So by bringing your mind back into the moment, helps you to relax. And even in the moment, if you can think of, be great, think of gratitude, like, okay, I'm thankful. I'm safe right now. Yep. Anything to keep the mind from going into the future of the unknown where you, there is no answer. Yeah, no, it's, that's really great advice. This is going to be our last question, which I can't believe. I feel like our time together has gone by super fast. Um, so I don't know if you know the answer to this one, but okay. this person says, I have a psychiatric service dog for PTSD. Would the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation consider referrals to trainers or training for service animals? I don't know if you've ever come across this question before. Me? Definitely not. Um, it's a good one and interesting. Let's see. You have a service dog. The CFF consider referrals Hmm. Actually, can you clarify the question a little bit? Are you asking like, um, like, are you looking for other patients so that they can experience the same for themselves? Like a and referral this is for from services? Janet. So Janet, if you're able to clarify, that would be amazing. Well, she clarifies kind of in the meantime, I just really honestly and truly wanted to thank you so much um, Maura has been such an amazing resource and such an amazing addition to the Gunnar Esiason Clinic and Care Center. And I'm just so thankful for your expertise with us today and just sharing those amazing resources. So again, we had a member from the CF Foundation put everything into the chat. After BreatheCon, you'll receive a resource guide. And there are just so many resources that Maura has put together. Please, please, please look into those. And then we are also going to be, um, did she clarify? Yes. Okay. Consider suggestions for trainers or trainee. Okay. Janet, okay. maybe offline we can um, get your email or you can drop it into a chat to one of the CF uh, members and we can get back to you with that question. That would be awesome. Um, but Maura, I just really wanted to thank you again. It has been so amazing. I loved all the questions that came in from the chat the questions that you and I were able to talk through with our amazing planning committee and just really sharing and being so honest. I want to destigmatize getting mental health help and taking medicine for it, right? If we were sick in our lungs and we we're in exacerbation, there's no questions. You would take oral antibiotics or get a pick line, right? And I want that exactly. to be the same for mental health. And I think that you have been so great 
during the session and so helpful. Um, I do want to let everybody know that before you go over keynote, if you could just take a quick second and filling out the satisfaction question under the poll tab on the right hand side of your screen, we would love to know how you felt about today's conversation. We would love any feedback, any suggestions if we should do this next time. Um, and then in 15 minutes, so at three o'clock Eastern time, please don't question me if it's mountain time or central because I'm not going to pass your test. But Eastern, Eastern time, um, in 15 minutes, we're going to move to our first round of small group conversations and panel discussions, which I'm so super excited about. Maura and I are so thankful that you all were here with us and thank you for attending. And Maura, again, thank you so much for coming on today. And I really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And I hope I was helpful. And I'm really so happy to be a part of the CF Foundation, the CF world. And I'm so impressed by all of you. You guys really are warriors. And I'm so proud of everything you guys do. Um, Showing up to clinic, being on, participating, being co-chairs. I really, you're an impressive group of people and you should all be proud of yourselves. Oh, so. thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending thank and have you. a wonderful rest of BreatheCon. We have so many exciting things. So bye everyone. Bye. Thank you for having me.